For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. In 1894, Thomas Melville, Eliza Logan, and Eliza Lennox, with her 12-year-old daughter Clara, were commended by assemblies to missionary service in China. This began a mighty movement of God among the assemblies in the United States to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations. Christian Missions in Many Lands was formed in 1921 to give those missionaries and others a centralized support. For the next 100 years, Christian Missions in Many Lands has helped to send out thousands of missionaries to over 150 different countries. These are some of their stories. After many survey trips over the great Amazon jungle, these five boys started out for this beach on the Kurai River. They marched up and down the beach, calling out some of the 26 phrases that they had learned of the Alka language. We like you. We are your friends. We want to help you. Well, between 12.30 and 12 minutes after 3, all five of these boys were slain. I felt that God had, God had prepared me for something here. God had a plan. In His infinite wisdom, He spared not the five fellows. Surely He has a plan and a purpose. Surely he will accomplish a great work through the death of these five. She always used to tell me that even when it happened, they were so convinced that they were doing what God wanted them to do, that they had this peace. Can I be bitter if I believe that God loves me? And if I have asked him to run my life, I'm only his servant. And so he can do with me or with anything I possess, anything he wants. I went back to Shandia, where Jim and I had lived. People all over the world began to pray for the Alcas. I asked him to send somebody in there, somebody who could tell them what the five men had wanted to tell them, that the God who made them actually cared about them, and that he was worth trusting. As Kimo was crossing the river uh, with his spear ready, Uncle Pete could have run up to the treehouse to get the gun. He could have run, tried to run away, but instead he continued to cross the river towards Kimo, and with the limited Alka language he knew, he was saying, we come in peace. We come to bring you good news. We come to express the love of Christ. In the moment, he still killed him, but that phrase, those sayings of Uncle Pete, resonated in his mind, he tells us to this day, and he's still alive and an elder in one of the assemblies there. They went there in obedience to the Spirit of God, to the will of God, and they opened the door. Faithful women came through that door into Alka land, learned the language, submitted to writing, translated the New Testament, and the power of the living word has produced real fruit among the Alkas. You give up your dearest loves in order to die for Christ in order to live for him and die for him in, in doing his will. In 1921, a newly married couple sailed from New York City Harbor to the coast of Nigeria, West Africa. That young couple was my grandparents, Raymond and Julia Hassey Dibble. People often asked them who was supporting them or providing for them. Their answer was always, the Lord has promised to. Grandpa knew he wouldn't always be here in Nigeria, and he was convinced that God was sending him to the Igala people to love them, learn the language, put it into writing, teach the people to read and write as he translated the Bible into the Igala language. Raymond was still working on getting the Bible into the Igala language, and now Dad was working on getting Emmaus courses and other books and hymns translated into three of the local languages. In 1967, my grandfather rang the big brass bell outside his office to joyfully tell all who could hear it that the translation of the whole Bible was complete. Grandpa believed that other languages are learned and understood with your mind, but that your mother tongue is understood with your heart. 
Cyril and Anna Brooks were pioneer missionaries in the Philippines, having arrived in the early 1920s. Their sole goal was to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to see New Testament works established. And so when they went, they went teaching the gospel. And those who came after them, they came as the next generation who were also now going out into some of the more provincial areas and seeing new works begun out there. Because Grandpa was involved with so many things besides a preaching and teaching ministry because of his extensive language abilities and, and knowledge. He had a, a goal, a dream to see the Bible translated from the original languages into Tagalog. When the war began, things changed dramatically for them. The Japanese took occupation of the Philippines. They could have gone home early. They saw the storm clouds gathering, but they stuck it out and they wanted to be there. And eventually they ended up in the internment camp. They were rescued at dawn by uh, some American parachuters. It's a great story. Then they went on to serve the Lord with many people coming to know the Lord and growing in their faith as a result of the work they were able to do after the war. Both of their sons and their daughter, Rose, all served the Lord in the Philippines. Bible School of the Year, the Amaris Correspondence work, mm. uh, they were involved in all of that. There is a huge legacy left. And many of the assemblies that we are in the Philippines now have no missionary. They have elders and deacons and the body of Christ functioning as New Testament churches. And that was the goal from the beginning. My father had seen the possibilities and the opportunities for the gospel in Burundi. And he was led of the Lord to move his family there. At first, they focused on Bible teaching and doing evangelism. They wanted churches that were grassroots as possible, that people felt the calling of God to be involved in uh, the church ministry and in evangelism. I think that my grandfather and grandmother were not only bringing the gospel, but they also reached out and helped meet practical needs. It's basically just living out your faith in every aspect of life. It's amazing to be able to partner with uh, mature national believers who have taught me so many things, who have been discipled by my dad or my grandpa. So I just feel like I'm really able to reap a lot of the labor that my grandparents and my parents uh, sowed here in Burundi. They went out of Burundi for a family vacation, and when they tried to come back in, they were not allowed back in, and, and they had closed the borders, and, and another uh, civil war had broken out. But that was instrumental in the Lord leading them to Tanzania, to Kigoma, because Kigoma is just at the Burundian border. So they just sort of planted in Kigoma. And we saw that the need just seemed to be much greater um, in Tanzania, with the churches struggling, just starting up. The Lord laid on our heart as we prayed that my parents needed, needed someone to go out there and help with the, all the churches that were starting up in these villages. There's not an elder in any of the Tanzanian or Burundian assemblies that is a missionary. I mean, they're all, they're all natives. They're all, they've all been discipled. It started with small seed with faithfulness with small things, and then God has helped the assemblies here grow, and they're still demonstrating faithfulness with larger things as well. Whether it was the Harrises that came from England or the Harrises that came from the U.S., Klingons that came from Michigan in the U.S., each one of them were innovators in their own way, serving the Lord through secular work initially and finding the Lord using them in a local culture of Mexico to reach others with the gospel. When I think about Bob and Marjorie Klingon, I think of missionaries that are driven by love. Their house was always busy, full of individuals coming and going, knowing that they were always welcome at the Klingons' table. Don and Claire Harris played a critical role in the history of the assemblies in Mexico. Though they had talked about missions early on in their relationship, they decided upon a life of business. Don and Claire were transferred there and really began ministering among the assemblies in Mexico City and beyond. I remember Don's deliberate mode of opening the scriptures and speaking to the minds of his hearers. They are now both with the Lord, but they will never be forgotten. Evelyn Anderson, Beatrice Cozen, 
Lloyd Opal, and Sam Maddox were commended by their assemblies to join veteran missionaries Les and Emma Chopard in the country of Laos. Their village was invaded by Viet Cong soldiers. Les and Emma escaped to a marsh near a cemetery and awaited help. Lloyd and Sam were captured as prisoners of war, and Beatrice and Evelyn were killed by North Vietnamese soldiers and left in a burning building. Evelyn Anderson and Beatrice Cozen followed Christ to their death. They gave up their lives for the sake of the gospel. I really believe that this was God's best opportunity for me to obey the great commission of Jesus Christ to make disciples of all nations. And I just thought, wow, here's this little country with not many people who know the Lord Jesus Christ yet. And the opportunity to declare his grace, that's where I want to be. I just love being in Laos and it soon became home. So after prison, it was not hard to uh, want to return to Laos. Robert and Christina Deans went to the Congo later in life, along with their three adult children, Bill, Ella, and Bob. Although Bill Deans was against the Deans family going first to Africa, uh, the Lord worked in his heart. He went to the Bible Institute one night and heard a missionary from South America speaking. And this missionary said, where are the men? In the middle of the night, he got up and knelt beside the bed and he said, Lord, I'm willing to go. The family worked together at great cost to take the gospel into unreached regions of the country. They went into challenging areas in the northeast of the Belgian Congo with medicine, education, and the Bible. Those early missionaries who pioneered the work in the bush, they planted, and now we have entered into other men's labors and we're witnessing a great harvest. The deans had a vision to leave the work, especially the churches, in the hands of the local believers. This was significant because in the 1960s, until recent times, the country has been embattled in devastating civil wars that forced many missionaries to leave the Congo. Because the missionaries had focused so heavily on training the national believers, the work in the DR Congo continues to grow and remain strong today, despite all the hardship they have faced. It is wonderful to see so many people coming to Christ and a national leadership that has grown so much to think that a movement of assemblies begun with a humble Bible study at the apartment of missionary Brian Killings. The Great Commission says that we're supposed to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Jesus has commanded us. So we've been trying to do that in Colombia for the last uh, 36 years. We're very thankful that in the Lord our labor is not in vain and uh, people have responded to the gospel. We're thankful that there are faithful men and women who are able to teach others also. We have more than 25 assemblies in the city of Bogota and they have come together to join forces and to work together for the gospel. So as the church keep growing, uh, they associated together. And now as new assemblies are planted or there are needs throughout the assemblies, we can send help where help is needed and hopefully help the gospel to grow in Colombia. Wallace and Ruth Logan regularly commit all their children to the Lord, asking not only to save them, of course, but to lead them out and to use their lives for God. So it was no surprise when uh, all seven children eventually found themselves in missionary work in Zambia or Northern Rhodesia, where we looked for poor them. Well, I think one of the biggest influences was even though they were busy missionaries, they laid aside twice a day, every morning and every evening for us all to get together and have a Bible reading. One of the things that we just saw time and again is how they just quietly trusted the Lord. They quietly modeled in front of us, just trusting Him for everything. And so that that's why there's so many little stories of things that happened that God did, that the only explanation is that God did it and because they had asked him in prayer to care for them, and he did. It's something that, by example, my parents showed us and gave us the opportunity to then in turn model that for our kids and now for the grandkids. 
Bert Elliott was Jim Elliott's older brother. He and his wife, Colleen, they went to Peru in 1949. The Lord used them in amazing ways to plant assemblies and make disciples and just make Christ's name great on the coast of Peru, up in the Andes Mountains, in the jungles. Bert and Colleen didn't begin their missionary journey with the intention of living a noteworthy life. They simply made themselves available for God to use wherever and however he wanted. We began to travel the rivers in a canoe and to visit the villages along the Wajaga River to preach the good news of Jesus Christ in the simplest form. And I have a profound faith in the power of the Word of God. That was his emphasis, to preach the gospel. But he wasn't satisfied to just see people brought to the Lord. He wanted to see them walking in obedience and having their lives transformed. As we continue to visit many of the places where they served the first years of their ministry, I would often come back with a report to them that brought them to tears. They would say, believers are still there pressing on. I would say, yes, they are. With tears in their eyes, they would praise the Lord for the perseverance of believers to continue the work. They were known uh, very quickly as people just full of love. It was their custom to spend from four in the morning to six praying before they even came out of their bedroom. And then they'd come down to the breakfast table and they always had, I don't know, it seemed like, you know, between five and 10 people that were staying with them in their house. Burton Colleen just kept serving faithfully and joyfully for 62 years. If there was ever a man that was like Christ, it was Bert. And if there was ever a woman who was strong and supporting her husband, it was Colleen. And they saw 100 assemblies planted in Peru, now 200 plus assemblies. Missionary work sometimes culminates in unforgettable martyrdom. More often it evolves what Eugene Peterson called a long obedience in the same direction. Years spent dying daily to self and living moment after moment for Jesus. They're just selfless in their service and they just serve with a heart full of love. They were driven by love for God's glory. They might not have been reached if those men had not been sacrificed. What I want is the will of God, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. They had a commitment and a surrender to the things of God. Whatever it was going to take, they were willing to do. That brought cost. That brought suffering. There's purpose to the suffering that we should become Christ-like. We must keep on and press on, we must not turn back. Through this experience of losing the one dearest in life to me, the Lord has taught me much. Many times I have mouthed the words, Jesus is all I need. He is the only indispensable one. God is probably not going to ask you to die for him. But what God is going to ask you is to live for him. And that's what the folks at CMML have been doing for 100 years. I found that he's a wonderful Heavenly Father who hears and answers prayer. All the glory must go to the Lord for the great things that He has done. And it is our prayer that the Lord will continue to work through many others, through CMML, to send men and women who are brave and love the Lord to the ends of the earth. My desire for each one is that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God, and that each one of you should discover and do the will of God for your life. He is guiding us by His Spirit to do the thing He brought us into this world to do.